Hello, my name is Ahmed Abbalkin. I work on Google Kubernetes Engine. So my job is to basically make Kubernetes Engine easier to understand to developers and defend developers' choices within Google. Uh, previously, I worked at Microsoft. I went into several Kubernetes-related open source projects. And my name is Yoshi. Uh, this is my third talk in this uh, next, so I'm glad I'm making it. <laughs> uh, I work on multi, I'm a product manager and a Kubernetes engine, and I work on multi tenancy, including, uh, I just gave a speaker, a GVisor sandbox, and the hardware accelerator, like a machine learning workloads, like in using GPU and Cloud GPU, all in Kubernetes engine. Okay. So let's jump into the topic. So we're going to cover um, multi tenancy, I mean, practical. Uh, thing in the Kubernetes engine. Kubernetes, um, I've been kind of talking this, I think everyone knows this because, you know, even a keynote, Kubernetes was mentioned so many times. It's everywhere and quite pervasive. Um, as a consequence, I think a large teams, large organizations have also adopted Kubernetes and also Kubernetes engine as a result, which is great. And then when large teams and large, you know, those large organizations come to us and, okay, I want to use Kubernetes. Cool. And people call, ask a common kind of question that, so I'm a large organization, I have multiple teams and with multiple requirements. How can we actually use Kubernetes engine um, cluster uh, with multiple teams? This is actually very, very kind of a complex, you know, uh, question because answering to you know how you do it, there are so many actually ways. And honestly, with that, you know, because there are so many ways, we actually we actually wanted to ask you a question. So uh, I, we created a link here, uh, gk.page.link multi tenancy. You'll see the questions. Um, I'm going to show this link later at the talk, so no rush, but. I think multi-tenancy is something that it's still emerging in Kubernetes, and we're trying to granule it in the Kubernetes engine. So we would love to you know, hear your opinion uh, about you know, what you're doing and what you want to do and where you want to go as well. To give you what I'm trying to get to about you know, complexity or challenge over you know, multi-tenancy, this is really the kind of a overview. I, we're going to cover this, but these are the kind of areas that you want to consider before or to answer to the original question. How can I share GK, you know, my Kubernetes engine among multiple teams? And Ahmed, our great instructor, uh, is here to guide you what you can actually do with the primitives uh, and the principles that we have today. So back to Ahmed. Thank you, Yoshi. All right, so we're going to talk about a lot of things today. It may seem like we're jumping from topic to topic, but it's going to be YAML heavy. So if you're, I'm assuming this is an uh, intermediate audience for, uh, that's familiar with Kubernetes. In this talk, I want to show, show you the practical aspects of multi-tenancy that you, know, you can go home and start using. But first, we, we must define the terminology that we're going to use. And I want to start with what is multi-tenancy. And in the software context, the multi-tenancy means a single of software running somewhere, and it serves multiple tenants, right? Um, you can simply say any website that you folks are using probably is a multi-tenant software, right? Um, so today, to today's topic is Kubernetes. And that's why we're going to talk about um, you know, Kubernetes as a multi-tenant system and analyze it. In Kubernetes terms, Kubernetes multi-tenancy is providing isolation and fair resource sharing between multiple users in a single cluster. This part is important. It's important that it is in a single cluster. So at the end, we're going to talk about like how we're going to talk about how the multiple tenants in a single cluster live happily without stepping, other, stepping on each other's toes. And uh, before we talk about multi-tenancy, I first want to talk about trust and why is it important. So let's go through these things. Um, anyone here completely trusts all these things in their deployment pipelines? Like they totally trust it. I don't think so. So a lot of things uh, that you use to deploy your software, run your software, or build your software, uh, mostly comes from people that you don't exactly know, right? Um, there are papers, scientific papers that I cited on the bottom right. You can take a look at about trusting compilers and you know verifiable operating systems is a space on its own. And then you, most of you will probably use open source dependencies, and your deployment pipeline is probably Jenkins or something else. And then there are container runtimes that you folks are using. Docker is, for instance, or ContainerD or whatever. So do you actually trust these runtimes? So 
it's not a binary or anything like that. It's not a binary choice. It's mostly like the, you're probably somewhere on the spectrum. So we, we classify these levels of uh, software uh, multi-tenancy in terms of trusted, semi-trusted, and non-trusted. So in the trusted case, everything comes from an audited source repository, right? It's, it's basically pretty much what Google does. And uh, the compiler is trusted, the build tr system is trusted, and even some of the hardware is trusted. But mo mo most people are not there, right? Most of, we, most of us are probably in some place that is semi-trusted. We have some trust components that we rely on, and we build our security models around it. So now let's talk about some of the Kubernetes engine multi-tenancy primitives. If, you, if you're already doing multi-tenancy today, you're probably segmenting your tenants in your clusters probably based on either creating a separate cluster for each tenant or creating a namespace for each tenant. And both options can be OK. And let's dive into how are they different. In the cluster per tenant case, you're basically creating separate control planes. By control plane, I mean the Kubernetes API. Anytime you run kubectl get or something like that, you hit the Kubernetes control plane. In this case, just because there are separate clusters, you get a separate control plane. And you might actually be getting separate networks as well if every cluster lives its own VPC virtual private network, right? Um, this can be still useful if you're separating your clusters between dev, stage, stage, and production. However, this has some shortcomings, such as if you have a lot of users, then you need, to, you need tools that, manage, that, yeah, that lets you manage tens and hundreds of, hundreds of clusters. And potentially, this is not a fun job to be at. And you need to, you need to worry about the fragmentation issues, the diverging configuration that happens in the cluster. And every time someone asks for you know, a runtime, you need to go actually provision that cluster. However, namespace is a little bit better than that. And it's mostly because Kubernetes is basically providing a lot of policy objects that are native to Kubernetes namespaces. So namespace is the building block that lets us uh, build our multi-tenant infrastructure on Kubernetes. And again, the pros of this is that anytime you run a cluster with multiple tenants, any configuration or setting or you know, uptime uh, reliability concerns that you apply to that cluster is shared by everyone. Anytime you add an add-on, extension is again shared by everyone. And in this case, it, since you're sharing the control plane, they all benefit from the same security uh, measures. So you know, we're going to talk about a lot of Kubernetes security primitives today. I just listed some of them here. Uh, I mainly categorize them under access control, resource isolation, and runtime isolation. And actually, we're going to recategorize them later. So now let's evaluate some of the common use cases with Kubernetes multi-tenancy. Like, what are the things that you might be doing so that you require a multi-tenant environment on Kubernetes? We're going to look at three different models. One of them is enterprise, where you're in a company and every team is potentially a tenant. And then there is the software as a service, which most users don't actually see Kubernetes, but the infrastructure still runs on Kubernetes. And then there's Kubernetes as a service, where you're basically accepting workloads from people that you don't know. So let's focus on the enterprise model first. In the enterprise model, all users are from the same company. So if anybody is doing something wrong, you can go fire them, right? Um, in this case, everybody gets its own namespace. Um, in, in the diagram you can see up here, there is a cluster admin that potentially you know, has the full permissions on the cluster. And then there are various users. You know, each emoji here is a different team. And then in a team, there is a namespace admin that has a little bit more permissions on that namespace. So to achieve these personas, we're looking at creating cluster roles. So again, you know, the cluster admin is full admin, namespace admin manages the users in that namespace, and then the user basically can apply, um, let's say, pods and workloads and load balancers and stuff like that, but they cannot actually edit the policies. So we're, we're going to come back to the policies later. In this case, since you're probably, the, all, the, all the source code is coming from a single code repository, such as your company's you know, uh, source repos, maybe the vanilla container isolation you get with containerd or Docker or something like that might be OK. But if it's not, if you're running components uh, that you don't trust much, uh, you might be considering to run on something like GVisor for sandboxing. Or you can use uh, Linux security primitives such as SecComp, AppArmor, uh, EC Linux, and stuff like that. 
So as far as the network isolation is concerned, um, we're going to come back to how network isolation is done. But I basically want to say that each namespace probably should be able to talk to anything in that namespace. And outside that namespace, you should be worried about who's calling your applications, right? So the next thing I'm going to touch is the software as a service model. This is a little bit different. Um, basically, in this case, the consumer deploys their app through a custom control plane. So the users of your software as a service does not know Kubernetes much. If they, maybe they are not actually seeing Kubernetes at all. In this case, after they deploy your app, um, after they deploy their app, they're basically connecting to the app directly, so they're not seeing Kubernetes in the middle at all. So Kubernetes is, in this case, is an implementation detail. So this is not very interesting to Kubernetes, actually. An example of this can be, you can imagine WordPress.com. Anytime you probably assume that theoretically you go to WordPress.com, you create a blog, and then WordPress.com probably creates some pods for you, and then you directly talk to your Kubernetes WordPress admin page, right? You don't see Kubernetes in the middle. But someone, in this case, the cluster admin has access to the Kubernetes API. And uh, basically, there is a SaaS API that is a trusted client of Kubernetes. So in this case, the, the class tenant workload can actually have untrusted pieces. And let's say you have a WordPress blog, and you're installing extensions. And extensions are potentially arbitrary code execution, right? So in this case, you may require something like sandboxing, again, with GVisor or some other runtime. And the last model that we're going to look at is the Kubernetes as a service model. Uh, this is, you can call this uh, containers as a service as well. You know, you're running a hosting company that you're accepting containers from everybody. What can go wrong? Um, in this case, tenants, again, you know, have different namespaces. But in this case, they're not seeing each other at all. So you have a little bit more stronger isolation requirements than the you know, enterprise or the SaaS that we looked at. And um, the isolation of WorldView can easily be achieved with uh, something like Kubernetes RBAC. Uh, again, the network isolation uh, requires stuff like the sandbox pods and, and the multi-tenant networking so that people are actually not uh, stepping on each other's networking and potentially snooping on each other's networking. So let's, let's talk a little bit about like, what are these policy objects and features that Kubernetes provides to us so that we can uh, use them in our you know, companies and in our clusters. So we previously talked about these uh, features like admission control, you know, RBAC, and quotas, and pod security policies, and a bunch of other things. So I'm actually going to uh, reorganize this a little bit like this. The first category is auth-related. And uh, the second category is going to be the scheduling-related primitives. But it actually doesn't matter. It's just so that we can easily go through them. So let me go through about, uh, let me go through the auth-related features first. If you're familiar with Kubernetes authentication authorization and admission, this is basically how an object comes to Kubernetes API. And from the Kubernetes API, makes it through etcd, which is where it's stored. You don't see the etcd in Google Kubernetes Engine case. But basically, when you're on your laptop, on, or let's say where there's a pod or a program calling the Kubernetes API, first we authorize that request. And the way we authorize that request is either through Kubernetes RBAC or Google Cloud IAM. In this case, if you're a Google user with your Gmail or whatever, you can be authorized to GK using the uh, IAM authorizer. And if you're not, if you're like a you know, Kubernetes service account, which is like a, you know, some identity that are given to pods, then you're probably going through RBAC. So if RBAC allows you, then the next thing is the admission control, which we'll talk about later. So let's dig a little bit, of in, dig a little bit deep into the authorizer. So Kubernetes RBAC is letting you figure out which users or which groups or which service accounts have access to which operations and which API resources on which namespaces. Um, so to look, at it, to look a little bit deeper into Kubernetes RBAC, so Two use cases for Kubernetes RPAC is you're either giving people access or you're giving Kubernetes service accounts access. And Kubernetes service accounts are used by the pods. So there you might have some controllers trying to access your Kubernetes API. And these APIs, the, in this case, the API will authorize the Kubernetes service account. So four key concepts in Kubernetes RPAC are uh, cluster role, which is you're just defining a persona, a set of permissions that uh, people can use cluster-wide. And there is a namespoke, namespace scoped version of that called just role. Uh, and the, there is a cluster role binding, which lets you bind cluster roles to users. In this case, a user could be 
just Google users, Google groups, you know, cloud IAM service accounts, or again, you know, Kubernetes service accounts. And the role binding is the namespace version of that. So here's an example RBAC. This, this must be the first YAML we're seeing today. Um, this is the example cluster role and example cluster role binding. And if I look here, I'm defining a namespace creator persona, which is a cross, uh, namespace creator cluster role. And then this namespace creator can do get, list, watch, create, delete, whatever, all these objects only on the namespace, right? And then when I go to the right side, I see the cluster role binding. And this cluster role binding is assigned to a particular user. That's my email address. Don't send me spam, please. Um, so it, it, just like I'm adding myself as a Google user, I can add a, add a group, I can add a Kubernetes service account, and so forth. So this is how you give access to someone to do something on your Kubernetes cluster using Kubernetes RBAC. So I'm going to jump off RBAC, and I'm going to you know, talk a little bit about the GKE IAM, basically, how we do cloud IAM. This is a little bit different, and it's an alternative to Kubernetes, R Kubernetes RBAC. So this is mostly practical for giving Google users and Google groups access to all clusters in your project. Let's say you temporarily need to add your colleague to um, all clusters as a Weaver permission. You can easily use that. So we provide four IAM roles today that we curated. Admin is like, basically, you can do everything. Weaver is you can view everything. Cluster admin is you can only manage the cluster's lifecycle and create, delete clusters, and upgrade them, and so forth. The developer is you just look inside the cluster and edit objects and create new objects within that cluster, and you don't know about GKE at all. So that's just Kubernetes related. And you can actually use IAM custom roles to curate your own more interesting roles. Again, like the namespace admin I just created using Kubernetes RBAC can also be created using Cloud IAM. So if you're interested in project-wide access, this is what you're looking at. So an example of GK IAM, I'm sure if you're actually using GK, you've probably seen this before. You know, you add an IAM policy binding on the project, you give some user or a group access, and you can specify which role you want. This is the uh, G Cloud CLI. And next, I'm going to talk about the admission controls. Uh, is, has anyone here actually wrote an admission controller before? I'm, I'm curious. No? Wow, that's amazing. So admission controllers are a primitive in Kubernetes that uh, the requests go through. So anytime you create a pod, Kubernetes calls a bunch of admission plugins. And each plugin tells Kubernetes this pod is OK or not. So anytime it happens, um, basically anytime you submit a request that is controlled by a particular admission plugin, your uh, request goes through a bunch of admission plugins like this. So after the admission plugins succeed, they basically run in serial one after another. They go into the etcd, and your pod is created after that. So admission controls are actually compiled into the Kubernetes API server. So this means you actually cannot go and change the admission plugins that already exist. And in Google Kubernetes Engine, we don't let you build, uh, we don't let you change the admission plugins that are already enabled. So in this list, you're basically seeing 15 admission plugins that probably correspond to Kubernetes features that you might be already using. So these are already enabled on GK today. You know, the list may, ch may change tomorrow or in a new version. But uh, today, you know, in a snapshot, it basically looks like this. So I said that the admission plugins are actually compiled into the Kubernetes binary. Um, but you can, uh, I think as of Kubernetes um, 1.9 or something like that, you can um, write your own Kubernetes admission plugins. And the way this works is, you know, you create a pod, and then pod goes through a bunch of other, a bunch of admission plugins, and then there is something called mutating admi admission webhook. And then that calls your webhook that you might have registered, and in that case, you actually change the API objects that before they are created. So let's say I'm just trolling people, and every time they create a pod, I'm going to change their pod name or something like that. You can, you can do something like this using the mutating admission webhooks. And the validating admission webhooks are basically just if the pod is good or not. So you can write your own admission uh, plugin. If the pod doesn't look good to you, you can just reject it, and the user users will see the rejection error in their kubectl or whatever. So this is a way to extend Kubernetes authorization model. If you, don't want some, if, the, if you don't want someone to do something on your cluster, and if the authorization is not enough, you can use the admission controls to enforce more strict policies at your companies by writing simple webhooks. 
So let's talk a little bit about the pod security policy. This is a relatively new feature again. Um, this, this restricts uh, host access, like host file system, host network, uh, the ports, the, you know, the process ID namespace, and stuff like that to the pods. Um, so let's say you want to create a privileged container. This actually prevents you from setting a policy that uh, prevents other people from creating privileged containers. So if you hate privileged containers, if you hate containers running as root, this is exactly what you're looking for. Uh, in this diagram, I'm looking at a pod spec coming through the admission coming to the admission control and the API, and then the admission control pod security policy admission controller checks the pod security specs that you have, and then based on that, it makes a decision. Again, you know, in this example, I, on the left, I have a pod security policy that this allows the privileged pods, and this allows the pods running as root user. And on the right, on the bottom right, I'm trying to deploy a pod with security context that has privilege equals true, and this pod will be rejected. So next thing is network policy. Uh, this is, again, a relatively new feature, and uh, I think about six months ago, uh, this has gone GA on Google Kubernetes, Google Kubernetes engine. So this, again, defines which pods can talk to which other pods. And this, is, you know, this can be determined based on which namespaces the pods live on. Or this can be depending on what labels the pods have. Or you can specify certain IP ranges that the pods cannot talk to or get traffic from. So network policy is basically firewall written in Kubernetes language for your pods. So we're offering this through Calico Networking plugin. If you create a cluster today with dash dash enabled network policy, you'll be getting that. An example network policy I have here is um, I'm selecting a bunch of uh, pods that have the label app equals MySQL. Uh, you can see in the blue. And then the next thing I do is I allow the ingress keyword here means allow traffic from the pods that have the labels app equals front end. So in this case, my front end pods talk to the MySQL pods. So what I did was I uh, created a repository for Kubernetes network policies a while ago at the previous KubeCon. Uh, you can find the link here. Uh, what I have in this repository is just a bunch of examples of all the cool things you can do with network policy. And I really encourage you to use Kubernetes network policy because it is right now not utilized well. And it is pretty good for if you're just looking for non-authorization and simple network firewalls. So let's jump onto the scheduling related features. The first one is pod priority and preemption. And the pod priority is, it lets you define a priority that the pods get. This is a numerical value. And depending on this numerical value, the pods are scheduled uh, earlier than the pods with the lower priority. So let's say your cluster is full and there's a scheduling queue. The high priority pod goes in front of the scheduling queue and it gets scheduled first. So if you have a bunch of you know, like, uh, space issues in your cluster, this kind of makes sure that the uh, high priority pods actually get run first. And the pod preemption, again, th these features are beta in, you're going to be beta in Kubernetes 1.11. And the pod preemption evicts lower priority pods from a node. So let's say your cluster is full. You don't have any more space, but someone just deployed something super important, like the, you know, the high priority web front-end application. It just released any version, and they need to scale up. What happens is that the pod preemption, uh, which will, again, come in 111, it's going to evict the lower priority pods from the cluster. And again, you know, this is depending on the numerical value. In this example here, I have three priority classes that I created. And one of them is high. You know, I just assigned the value like 1 million. And then there's a normal. It has value of 1,000. And then there is a global default true. This means that if I create a priority class like this, uh, this global default true gets applied to any pod created by default. And then the low has value 10. And this is a non-namespace object. So when you apply this to your cluster, everyone uses it. So if you, have, if you come up with certain priorities at your company, this is something that you can directly utilize. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about resource quotas. This is probably the most important policy object if you're trying to limit usage in your companies in a single cluster. So resource quotas are uh, per namespace. It, lim it lets you limit the total memory, CPU, storage use, and you know, like the load balancer use, and how many pods a namespace can have, how many config maps, or whatever a namespace can have uh, for each tenant. So here's an example resource quota. In this resource quota, I'm deploying these to the staging namespace. And on the left, I'm basically saying, 
on this namespace, you can have only 30 pods. And you can have two total services. You cannot have services with load balancer type, because that load balancer is a public load balancer. If, you know, if I know that this team is not going to need a public load balancer, I can just disable that. And I let this team use five, volu per five persistent volumes. These are uh, on GKE, they are like GCE persistent disks. So, which is a billable resource. In this case, I can kind of limit the spending of this team. And on the right, I have the compute quota of this team. I can say I'm allocating eight cores of CPU uh, or 10 cores of CPU uh, if, they, if they're burstable to this uh, particular tenant. And in the, as far as the RAM is concerned, I'm uh, allocating three gigabytes of RAM to this tenant. And again, I'm, I have a storage field here, which basically says that the total volume of the persistent volume claims cannot go over 120 gigabytes. So resource code is fairly uh, flexible, and it lets you do stuff like that. So as of uh, Kubernetes 1.11, uh, some features go in alpha. And that feature is where I think Kubernetes is allowing you to combine resource quotas with priority classes. So if you ever you know, wondered, oh, what if like, I want to set five CPUs for my high priority workloads? That's exactly what you're looking at. So on the top left here, I define a low priority class. You know, we defined that before. And then here, I'm basically uh, creating a pod with the priority class low. That's an unimportant pod. And on the right, I'm setting a resource quota in this namespace based on the priority class. So I'm saying that low priority class pods can have, in total, I can have 100 of the, these pods, and I, they can only use a you know, total of 10 CPUs and uh, 12 gigabytes of memory. So one of the again, most important features you're probably going to you know, go home and uh, try out is the pod anti-affinity. So this feature, uh, basically, if you don't want to co-locate tenants on a single node, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, finance companies have this requirement, uh, this is kind of uh, what you're looking for. Pod anti-affinity lets you use constraints, uh, such as labels, to prevent scheduling on certain nodes. In this example, I have a pod uh, that says label equals, uh, sorry, the label has team equals billing, and on the right, I have another pod that is specifying a pod anti-affinity rule. And I'm saying that, look at the Kubernetes host name. This is the node name, right? And in, the, in this node name, don't put me on a node that does not have the billing, another pod that has the billing label. So this lets you, again, flexibly use this cluster. So anytime someone you know, uh, gets scheduled there, the next thing you do is another pod that comes in basically uh, trusts this model and then it will not get scheduled by Kubernetes under any circumstance to that node. Another uh, concept that you might utilize, especially if you have different source of hardware in your data center, is dedicated nodes. Let's say you have a machine learning team. They ordered a bunch of GP nodes, right? Or they're already using GP nodes on Google Kubernetes Engine. And uh, in this case, you can reserve these nodes for the machine learning team, and then no one else will be able to schedule to it. And the way this works is we're using taints and tolerations feature on Google Kubernetes Engine. So normally, what you do is you run the command kubectl uh, taint node and then specify the node name to put a taint on the node. But in GK case, you can directly apply these tenants to the node pools. So anytime the node pool scales up or a pod gets or a node gets removed because of auto repair or a scale down event or something like that. All of the nodes in that node pool will always have this team equals machine learning, no schedule tenant. So GK offers you this flexibility to do that. And as far as the tolerations are concerned, um, any pod that wants to schedule on this node needs to have this particular toleration, as you see on the bottom right, that's saying machine learning effect no schedule, and you know the team, team equals machine learning. Uh, I'm going to use the effect no schedule. So when you use that, your pod gets scheduled onto the GPU node. So again, I'm, uh, I'm going to call Yoshi to here, and he's going to talk about sandbox pods and GVisor. Thank you, Ahmed. Awesome. Uh, before I actually jump in, how many of you actually came to my uh, GVisor talk, which happened like three minutes ago? I have, or, OK, great. Um, so for those, sorry, it's going to be a little bit of repetition. But if you have any questions later, we could definitely talk about it. So sandbox pause, um, we, I want to talk about a lot of primitives that we have today in Kubernetes and Kubernetes engines. 
Sandbox pause is something that we're trying to, we are building today and hopefully to address the fundamental problem around a container isolation boundary. Uh, there are two approaches right now, uh, which we're going to talk to you about. But before that, uh, there are two. Uh, one is Kata container is one that will uh, hopefully come, you know, uh, work with the Sandbox Pod API. And we have uh, Gvisor as a runtime for the Sandbox API. Uh, the concept of Sandbox is really about uh, contain making containers really contain to address the threat that's coming from inside, which we'll talk right now uh, very shortly. So Gvisor, this is the Google approach uh, to the Sandbox pause. So Gvisor is a kind of run, you know, new runtime for containers to really make it contain inside this Sandbox. Uh, today, when you run containers, uh, containers will directly interact with the host Linux kernel. And the system interface there, like syscalls and slash, pro, uh, slash proc file system, you have a very huge and you know huge attacking surface there. And if a container actually, uh, uh, if a malicious application inside the container uh, exploits the bugs in the you know, in the kernel and then escapes that container, they basically you could you know and then the um, privilege discussion happens, then basically your system could be compromised. Now, as you can see from this diagram. Gvisor will sit in the middle, and, per, and it, it by itself is an independent kernel. Uh, it implements uh, the Linux system calls in user space. By saying that, what I mean by that user space is that container would still think that, oh, my syscalls, system calls are handled properly. But what it's actually interacting with is the system, the, the user in the independent kernel that is running inside that user space. So what's going to happen is that even if the Gvisor, well, it's just one other software, has a vulnerability, and this malicious software happened to be able to take advantage of that and breaks in. Now, what's going to happen is that basically it, that's one, it only just broke the one boundary. You still have another boundary between Gvisor and kernel. Another aspect about Gvisor is that there are a lot of uh, tools that would harden Linux and reduce the system surface, such as second filter and SE Linux. The challenge there is that you do need to know what you're doing for your application and your users. And even if you're able to do so, uh, it doesn't mean that you can use the policy for every application. You have to mandate that to the application to follow that guideline, or there you can lower, you know, or you lower the bar. So what's gonna happen like and frequently is that if you try to cover more application, more use cases, then you'll you know step back, step back a little bit, and then you have I mean, much more less described in policies or rules there. On the other hand, and it's, it's definitely kind of complex to actually come up with that. Now, on the other hand, Gvisor, uh, it does not have any configuration. Uh, we'll look into it later. But you know, from an application standpoint, you can bring in you know, basically you know, any application on top of Gvisor uh, and run on top of it. And you have to modify it. The Gvisor itself is written in Go language, which is the memory and type safe. Uh, type safe. Um, that's much more uh, stronger language to describe the system component like the Gvisor. So Gvisor on Kubernetes, how it's going to look like from an architecture perspective. Uh, Gvisor is going to provide a sandbox. But on top of that, we have run C, which is an OCI runtime that is actually powered by G uh, Gvisor. So Kubernetes will, could be talking to uh, this run C by OCI, or even Docker can talk to uh, a run C by uh, OCI. As I mentioned, so underneath it, there's a, your container uh, will be running inside a sandbox. And you'll see, in this case, uh, the Sentry, uh, Sentry, the user land kernel of Gvisor, is wrapping around that container. Uh, and then there's another filter, uh, which is seccom plus namespace underneath Sentry, which we call another boundary. So basically, one isolation and two isolation boundaries, second and first and second. To show how it kind of works, um, when the, your container makes a system call, then it will be trapped by the, so we, we call it kind of platform. I show KVM here, but we also have Ptrace. Uh, the, your syscall will be captured and forwarded to the user land kernel. So this is the first key. Instead of implement the syscall system call in the kernel, level, kernel in, in kernel, it goes back to the user land and then implement as much as possible. 
there are cases uh, there, uh, to implement, uh, a sentry has to call the system call to implement the request to syscall, but we significantly filter uh, the actual system call the sentry is going to make to the Linux kernel, uh, and that's exactly where seccon comes into play, and it is surrounded by a namespace. Uh, it's around like uh, 10 to 20-ish syscall compared to the full 300, you know, 20-ish uh, syscalls that's exposed in the regular Linux kernel. So it's much more restricted. File I.O. and networking is also another surface that we have to take care of. Uh, by default, container, your container will not have direct access to the file host file system. Everything will be handled by so-called go, uh, Gopher, which will handle the file and networking. And we have 9P protocol to, uh, uh, to connect Gopher and, uh, and the sentry there. So this is, like I mentioned, the sandbox pod in Kubernetes. This is exactly what we're working. We're leading the effort with, uh, in, in the community. Uh, it is work in progress. Um, so it's not something available yet. Uh, but I think we have a very uh, final stage of the, the spec uh, at this moment. Actually, this is really my third time revising this stack. So what I'm showing now is the latest one. Uh, there's no guarantee that it's not going to change. I'm pretty sure that things will change on the way. So just drink it as a grain of salt. And also, like unlike Ahmed's uh, awesome YAML file, I'm on PM. I'm just going to take advantage of that to say very simple uh, short YAML file uh, for my talk. So the runtime class is the new API to specify runtime uh, so that we can implement this concept called sandbox pods. Um, the left side of this YAML file is the actual way to specify the runtime class. And you can see the meta name. So, so this, this runtime class will be named gvisor. And inside there, this runtime handler called gvisor. Inside this runtime handler, you can specify the actual executable file and all the parameters in there. Uh, but we believe that this left side, uh, the specifying the runtime class part, uh, will be defined by the cluster admin. Or in case of cloud, like us, you know, uh, Google Kubernetes engine, it will be us who will be uh, defining the runtime class for you. And from a user perspective, uh, you only, all you have to do is to specify which runtime, which runtime class you want to use for your pod. So on the right side, you can see this. All you have to do is just a regular, write your regular pod and then say runtime class name gvisor, which is provided by, from your, which is defined by the left hand side. So it's very straightforward. All righty. Um, so we talked about multi-tenancy, uh, and Ahmed talked about, you know, you know discussed, and I hopefully, uh, you know, introduce you to what are the things needed to uh, use multi-tenancy. But there are some areas that we're still working on, and where the community is still kind of working on. So I just wanted to go quickly go through that. Policy management. I think this is really perhaps in my, in my, only myself, but when Ahmed was talking about RBAC and policy and all the YAML files, it is indeed, um, you know, you have to know what you need to do. And doing just one is already complicated enough. But when, if you're responsible for providing such environment for a larger organization with many, many projects, yes, it's not going to be necessarily scalable. It is a challenge to make sure that, that IAM and policy is up to date, right? Like once you define it, great, but how do you know that is actually still consistent? in the long run and or the, like a different projects or teams. So that will be the kind of challenge. And I'm very excited to uh, introduce this Kubernetes engine policy management. This is very new, alpha. This is the uh, uh, product that my colleagues are working on. And unfortunately, uh, we have this kind of a colliding. So it's, the talk is now happening in Moscow and South. Uh, Moscow and South. So I will strongly recommend to watch that video uh, once it gets uploaded. But I was just going to tell you the nutshell, because I had a chance to uh, you know, understand the vision from the TL and the PMs uh, yesterday. So like I mentioned, the policy management and scaling that is very, very challenging. So the ideal vision here is that all you have to do is come to the you know, uh, Kubernetes you know, con cloud console, and when you specify the project from your organization folder, you know, if you opt in, once you create a project, it will automatically create a namespace inside your cluster for you. So like team building or team development, once you do that, it will always create a namesake with that particular labeling so that you don't have to worry about it. So the larger vision is that 
yes, you can specify a lot of those policy here and there, but isn't it much more effective and ideal you know, developer and user experience if we could provide a cohesive kind of view there? And that's what's all about with this uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, engine policy management. So uh, two things. Uh, so the talk, IO200, happening now. Um, let's definitely, I, I strongly recommend watching this after uh, once it gets uploaded. Also, this is an alpha. They absolutely want feed, uh, you know, sign, you know, somebody to sign up and also feedback. So please come to this, you know, uh, click, to, uh, go through this uh, sign up form uh, if you're interested in, in scaling your policy and management. Also, um, Kubernetes multi tenancy has some, a lot of, you know, some limitation. One is that, uh, for, for now, uh, the API calls are not rate limited. So you can see that you know, this is, could be a, a perhaps one of the attacking surface. Uh, and we, should, you know, we, we need to address that in the long run. And also networking is also not a kind of scheduled resources yet. Uh, so we do need to uh, figure out what will be the right way to kind of slice the networking resource and attach it to the, the, uh, to the namespace. And also, tenants can still discover each other via, um, by the Kubernetes DNS. So these are the kind of a high-level control plane robustness and kind of a, you know, isolation that we will probably need if we want to implement the full Kubernetes um, multi-tenancy, which the, the model that uh, Ahmed introduced uh, in, earlier in his slides. OK, so key takeaway for the uh, multi-tenancy in general uh, first, uh, define it. It's kind of a two, you know, it's a very kind of rule of thumb, but I think it's very important. Um, determine your use case. Uh, is your user coming from outside your organization or inside your organization? That's one way to look at it, but perhaps much more important. How trusted is, you know, you know, are your tenant and users and workloads? This is, this is actually perhaps more, more important. If you trust everyone correctly, and if you trust whatever software that they're going to bring in, I think you have a better, you know, you're in a better position uh, to not to use all the isolation mechanism or policy intensively. But if not, you do, you, you do need something. And related to that, what sort of a degree of you know, isolation that do you want to have? Is it for the cluster level or the tenant toleration that I'm going to talk about, you know, it's a node level, or we actually want to even split inside a node. And if you're looking for that, yes, sandbox spot will be definitely kind of uh, something you wanted to think about. And the namespace uh, specific, you know, multi tenancy. Um, we do understand as of now the namespace is still perhaps a newer concept. Uh, for those who are already kind of taking, you know, using namespace, I think that, you know it's totally fair to think that um, namespace is the kind of starting point to think about the multi-tenancy in Kubernetes and Kubernetes engine. But I also understand that for though there are people who are run, actually running multi-tenancy services, so team A, team B, running a same cluster but not using namespace. Um, that's totally fine, but I definitely do recommend you know you know using you know, considering namespace uh, you know moving forward, and here you want to utilize a policy object and scheduling and access control, and also you know, think about the persona and how you want it to map into the RBAC you know cluster you know, rules uh, in there, and if you have you know. If you if you have more complicated now, of course you could definitely you know the problem is already complex enough for a single cluster. But if you actually do want it to have more robust and great user experience from single cluster to multiple cluster, this GK uh, Google Kubernetes Engine Policy Management that's going to be announced right and has been announced now will be the great choice for you. So I strongly recommend looking into this. Okay, so that's it I think. So I might wanted to. Talk about the call for actions. Yeah. Um, in this case, we want you to bring your opinions to the multi-tenancy space. So for that, uh, you can, I'll keep this slide up for a bit so you can take a picture of that and uh, go to gk.page.link slash multi-tenancy and you know, fill up this form to you know, register your interest. What do you want to see? What is your use case? We really want to hear about this. And in the open source community, the work is still happening. When we look at the Kubernetes space a year ago, there were only a few of the 
policy objects that we were talking about. And now we're at a state where most of the policy objects are in, uh, some of them are already GA, such as the resource quota, and some of them are going beta, and some of them are coming up very recently as alpha. So we want also you to, if you're interested in this space, we want you to participate in the open source community. So most prominently, the relevant working group in Kubernetes space is going to be the multi-tenancy working group. And in this, uh, in this case, the, uh, this work group is led by engineers from Google and Microsoft, and you, know, you can find ed, uh, links here to join these, this work group. Similarly, the policies are very key to Kubernetes multi-tenancy. And the Kubernetes policy working group is looking at these sort of policies, basically how we can use the namespace log logical boundary and take it to a place where people can use it to uh, achieve multi-tenancy in their clusters. Again, the Kubernetes policy working group is its a pretty fun place to hang out. I would totally recommend reading their design docs. And there are two other working groups that I have not listed here. Uh, one of them is SIG Auth, which uh, looks at authorization and authentication. If you're interested in RBAC and you know, IAM and how these things work, and if you want to you know, bring, I don't know, your own YDC provider and stuff like that, if you want to provide opinions in that area, uh, SIG Auth is where you, sh what you should look at. Again, um, another one is SIG Scheduling. As the name indicates, uh, they bring a lot of stuff from the policy work group and you know, already, from, already stuff that exists in Kubernetes, such as you know, I've talked about how the pod preemption and pod priorities work. This is SIG, SIG Scheduling. So uh, you should definitely check out the SIG Scheduling as well. If you're generally interested in you know, that distributed systems scheduling space, um, SIG Scheduling, again, is a nice place to hang out. And there are a lot of interesting design docs there. Um, so this concludes our talk. Thanks again for coming up. Um, again, you know, this link is still going to be there, so if you feel free to take pictures of that. Um, if you have questions, I think we have only a few minutes, yeah. uh, but we can you know, get questions at the mic, but we'll make ourselves available here after the talk as well. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions. Again, thank you very much. Thank you.